Thank you so much for this lovely invitation to come down to Oxford. Um, there was a point in my life with my husband where we came here a lot. My husband worked for Oxfam. Um, but uh, for the last 23 years, I've been living in Glasgow. So coming down to Oxford is really lovely. And there have been many attempts today to prevent me from making it, um, all of which were to do with planes, trains, and automobiles. So I'm delighted that about 10 minutes ago, I managed to fumble my way in through the door and arrive with you. Um, and whenever I hear that introduction, I wonder who on earth I am. I really don't recognise myself. And perhaps the most important things you need to know about me is that I love gardening and I bake bread and I have just in the last six weeks become a grandmother. <laughs> and, and, and I'll tell my daughter about that round of applause because she deserves it. <laughs> so my title is The Arts of Integrating. And when I was awarded the UNESCO Chair in Refugee Integration through Languages and the Arts, um, I was allowed to come up with a full title for myself. So Languages and the Arts were clearly set from the work I'd done for a long time. And the themes of refuge were important to me. But I've always felt it's important to have in your title words which are difficult, which are unsettling and not settled, and which we can think with and critique for a long time. And we're at a point in time at the moment, I would contend, when the word integration is being used particularly in the Green Paper on um, social and cultural cohesion and community co cohesion in England and Wales, is being used and appropriated and undergoing a semantic shift into an area which is more about assimilation and assimilationist policies. And we all know that it's never possible to assimilate into any nativist identity completely. So integration is a really interesting, difficult word when that's one pull within the United Kingdom. It's also a different pull within the, United, within the European Union because in the European Union, integration is a multilateral endeavour. It is beholden on all citizens of the EU to integrate and be integrating into, yes, the European Union, into each other's lives and cultures through the mobility projects, but also in the realm of refugee integration for refugee integration work to be a shared <coughs> joy and a shared burden and not something which is loaded entirely on one population, usually in our own understandings, the refugee population. Within the Scottish context, and I think it's important for me to set that because that's the work I chair at the moment, um, integration begins for asylum seekers on day one of arrival in Scotland after dispersal. In England and Wales, it's only after refugee status is granted. In Scotland, it's from day one of arrival. And in Scotland, because of the areas that are devolved responsibilities, that means education, social care, um, health, housing, as devolved responsibilities, all cluster around supporting refugees and the communities into which they are housed to be integrating together as part of the life of the, the, the country. So we've got a really interesting kind of patchwork with the European Union, England and Wales, and then Scotland, all kind of pulling at this integrating word in different directions. And within that, the scholarship is largely and has largely been undertaken from within the social sciences and also to a certain degree econometrics, trying to tabulate and come up with indicators and indexes of degrees of integration. So how integrated are you on a scale of one to five is the kind of question that we find being asked on quite a regular basis. Um, as you can see, my title is not going to take us into scales and metrics and numbers. I married an accountant in the hope that that would be the last time I had to deal with numbers. <coughs> um, I'm much more interested in integration as an art, as an art of hum human being, as an ontological endeavour. And as an art, I believe it's also underpinned by an understanding of ethics as well as aesthetics and we can debate Aristotle maybe on that point afterwards. So let's have a look at one of the key symbols 
that is now pretty much eradicated of the ethic uh, of displacement and dispossession that underpins questions of how we integrate within the European Union and around our own borders. <coughs> so the fence that you can see in that picture was paid for, for by UK taxpayers' money, um, but it's in France. These are the Calais camps, and some of you, I'm sure, will recognise these. Um, my understanding of migration is that you only really understand it by also looking at its opposite, at stasis, about the things that frustrate movement and that keep people and things in place, as well as those that move them. And I believe at the moment that we're looking at competing, as well as competing understandings of integration, competing understandings of, um, of displacement and movement. And under that, competing understandings of the ethics that underpin those. So here we have, I think, um, an ethic of displacement and containment and bordering, which comes out of an ethic of security, and particularly the ethic of security to the nation state, which creates the borders and produces some of the geographies that you can see in that um, image there. My colleague, Teresa Piacentini, has written really powerfully about this particular image. And she said that what you see here is the, the work in the front, which is integrating work, it's actually quite ecological. It's things found, it's things made by, yes, people who've arrived as refugees, but also people who are in communities supporting them. They look like houses. And they're often little rows of shops with orderly tomatoes for sale, um, five or six of them, and maybe some packets of cigarettes next to them. Behind them is what was produced and provided by the, um, by the state of France for um, the housing of refugees in particular. And the issue with that is that these are containers that are the symbol par excellence of the movement of goods and free trade. And here they are used to contain and keep people in place. So these are the places where particularly, around about 80% at the time I was there, um, 80, uh, um, Eritrean refugees were being housed. And the refugees being housed there were um, often people who knew the inside of containers like this very intimately, just a long way down the recycling chain. Because containers like this are used in Asmara and in Sawa and in other places within Eritrea for um, prisons and are used for those who are conscientious objectors, who wish to refuse the draft or who wish to leave the country. And they are kept often about 40 men at a time inside of those containers, often for up to five years at a time. I certainly know of one man kept in there without being allowed any daylight and subject to quite horrific torture whilst he was in there. But these are the things, things, containers, thought of by the French state as safe for people escaping that context to be housed in. So again, you can see that tension that I'm trying to unpick here around safety being something that for the people um, we certainly met and spoke with in the Calais camps were the opposite of safety. They signified everything that was inhumane and were not spaces that they wanted to go into. They would rather move into particularly the, the kinds of shelters that you see here, but also others as well. Simon Vey said in times not dissimilar, though also different to our own, that once a certain class of people has been placed by the authorities outside the ranks of those whose life has value, then nothing comes more naturally than murder. So for me, I think we're dealing with necropolitics, the politics of death, and necroethics, the ethics which believe that the deaths of a certain class of people are required for the ethical upholding of certain understandings of security. And I think we're seeing those in very stark ways around the camps, which are the places where integration is frustrated and movement is frustrated and stasis remains. Hannah Arendt, again, in times not dissimilar to our own, in that extraordinary essay of hers, written in 1942 after her arrival as a refugee in New York. And it's an essay that I've really spent the last four or five years meditating with, and I use that word advisedly, 
Um, she says, apparently no one wants to know that contemporary history has created a new kind of human being, the kind that are put in containment camps by their friends and concentration camps by their foes. Another way, perhaps, of understanding this is in um, a way I've seen described in quite playful terms, but very pointed terms, as the ethic of the garden fork. Imagine two children playing ball in a garden, and they kick that ball over the hedge into the neighbour's garden. That neighbour has a choice. That neighbour's boundaries may have been breached. This may be trespass. This may be something to do with a violation of property rights. But that neighbour can pick that ball up and throw it back over the fence. Or that neighbour can take the garden fork, pierce the ball and throw it over the garden fence. The ethics of property, retribution, trespass, or perhaps a different kind of ethic that requires a different kind of art. In talking about the refugee crisis, which to me is not a refugee crisis, it's a crisis of hospitality and a crisis of reception. I believe we are deeply in an epic story that is full and resonant with archetypes that go back at least 2,000 years, but also further in my own tradition of faith, but also in other traditions of faith. And that's the epic story of what happens when we withhold hospitality. The epic story of kith and kin, who that is and what that means to be part of a human family or to decide that some are not. And the softening of borders and how that happens and the softening of borders of the skin. So Calais for me is one symbol of that, right on our own borders and within our jurisdiction given that we pay for the fence. This was um, when I was there at Easter, um, now nearly three years ago, um, just before and as we could hear the bulldozing of the Camp Sud, the camp in the south. And we, um, I was there leading a delegation of members of parliament from Scotland, from the Home Affairs and Justice Committee. And we went inside the church, the famous church that you may well have seen on Songs of Praise, a beautiful, extraordinary building made of plastic and bits of wood and with beautiful um, icons from the Eritrean Orthodox tradition within it. Um, and when we were inside that church, kneeling next to people who were at prayer themselves in their own sanctuary, we could hear the bulldozers coming closer and closer. And those words of Simon Weil about people being set outside and being subject to destruction and murder were very much in my head. Elaine Scarry, um, the philosopher, the professor of thought at Harvard University, isn't that just such a wonderful title? Um, <coughs> she has written a, a number of very um, important books, I think, which really help us think with these times. But her book in 1980, um, The Body in Pain, is one that within my work I've found has words strong enough to hold some of our thinking. And she speaks about what happens to people on the move or people who are allied with their causes when they witness or experience great suffering. And she says that intense pain is language destroying. As the content of one's world disintegrates, so that which would express and project the self is robbed of its source and its subject. Words, self and voice are lost or nearly lost, she says. And for me, that's led me to look a lot at languages and the, the, the voices that we choose with our Anglo-normativity, our insistence that everyone, certainly in the England and Wales and policies, learns English within two years or else, and what it means to place people in those situations, what it means to create landscapes which are quite desolate and mono in their linguistic uh, abilities, but also what it means we're not learning from previous stories, and particularly from Holocaust survivors, of how long it takes you to tell a story, to recount a journey, and in which language you might do that, because much of the, the psychotherapeutic and narrative record demonstrates to us very clearly that learning another language will help you with some of that therapeutic journey, will be a distancing device in some of the ways that Brecht's theatre can create a distancing device. But it will take a long time before you're at a point of having words enough to tell the story.
The symbol you just saw is Funtu Fenumfu Denchen Fenumfu. It's an Adinkra symbol. It's a symbol that was created at times of slavery when people were being taken into cap captivity and sold often by their friends and certainly by their colonizers into slavery, um, produced by um, the, 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 the Ghanaian tribes at the time. And it talks of a crocodile with two stomachs. And in that symbol is a motif for hospitality and for sharing and a warning against greed and where it leads. For me, it's also a symbol of necropolitics and necroethics inscribed into previous histories, epic histories of movements, migrations and deaths. This was back in 2013 when um, a boat capsized off Lampedusa. There had been many that had camps capsized off Lampedusa in the Mediterranean beforehand. But in this one, around um, close on for 500 people drowned, 478 people drowned in total, of whom 80% were Eritrean, about 20% were Sudanese. Inside those coffins, and it's quite unusual to see coffins like that um, because they're rather beautiful coffins. They're not cheap coffins. Inside those are the bodies of people who, upon their death, were granted asylum. So again, stasis, integration, hospitality, cost. And perhaps I should also say that inside one of those coffins is a member of my own family. Where are your monuments, your battles, Marta, in that grey sea? The sea has locked them up. The sea is history. Usually, as a gardener, I really love spring and I love to see the daffodils appear. And the daffodils are, of course, that great poetic image of spring and all of us are already hearing Wordsworth as I say that or as you look at that. But I find again and again that I need to turn to poetry and the arts of poetry as a linguist myself to make sense of what we're experiencing at these times and the therapeutic poetics of what we're encountering. <clears throat> so this was the poem I wrote in Calais three years ago. Daffodils. For the first time, the daffodils do not bring me cheerfulness. Their nodding yellow heads, incongruent, stubborn, sunshine at the wrong end of winter. It is wartime. The earth wrestles against the seed corn. The ploughed fields may or may not see harvest. There are old gun emplacements on the cliff tops, looking across the estuary to the nuclear power plant. Around their concrete bases, the same jaundiced flowers, spring's heralds or signs of our fear. I do not know whether to fight or to flee. I do not know if the east wind will spread the pollen or freeze away the first hope of life. On the borders of Europe, on the borders of Australia, on the borders of the United States of America. They are herding people into cages and sending them back, sending them back to the bombs. And on the borders of this field, there are daffodils nodding away as the bodies wash again out to sea. Um, many of my friends lament the fact that I am indeed a poet of lamentation. Um, and my colleague Tawana, who's written um, this uh, call and response volume with me, is very definitely a poet of praise. Um, but I, I want to turn to the way in which I think ethics meets migration in a more positive sense, and one that isn't about necroethics, but is actually much more about hospitality. And to turn back to the Desert Fathers, who will need no introduction in this audience, though often in most of the places where I will speak of them, they really do draw blank faces, sadly. Um, but the story of the third, the third who went to visit one of the Desert Fathers, and he said, the third said, the grass is growing up my chimney, and the father said, the hermit answered, and you have driven away hospitality. The grass is growing up my chimney and you have driven away hospitality. And again, in that cold image of a 
fireplace with no hearth and no fire, nobody sitting around it, no one toasting mars marshmallows or drying their hair. In that cold image, to me, is an image of necroethics and necropolitics. Because a home without hospitality is a terribly sad thing and a terrible thing. And it is itself a death wish. And in parts of Europe and in parts of our own country, in constituencies here, there are places where, certainly in Bulgaria, I'm thinking of a village where the lowest, the youngest person is 75. And they have said that they would rather the village died out than accept a single refugee to bring life back. A home without hospitality is like the deserted villagers of Kilmartin up in the highlands of Scotland that were cleared and where you still see the ruins. It is a terrible, sad, lamentable thing. So for me, out of that necropolitics and a move into um, the idea of hospitality is an understanding of, of that difficult word of integration as being underpinned by a deeper understanding of hospitality. And it's really, it's both lovely and humbling to be presenting this lecture today in a place of hospitality. Um, again, um, often the dry, um, quite atheist, secular corridors that I speak into, either of government or of academia, um, are a little disturbed by an, an, a, a, a reintegrating or a revisiting um, of the concept of hospitality. Whereas here I know I'm both on dodgy ground and quite hallowed ground. But integration for me is about the performing of hospitality and it's an art. Um, the question of hospitality is about mutuality, is about reciprocity, it's both individual and collective and for me it's at the heart of what Martin Buber talks about as das Zwischenmenschliche, the quick of human relatedness, the kind of in-betweenness that we feel between us, but which is often ineffable, but which produces relationships. Derrida said that hospitality is culture itself. Usually we go to the limits of hospitality in his great, great essays on hospitality and in his work on the cities of refuge. But for me, that quotation really deserves our attention. Culture is all about both setting limits and striding over them. Each generation makes culture anew by testing it and moving it on and reshaping it. So hospitality is culture itself. And in the Oxford English Dictionary, and I, uh, part of my late bedtime reading or when I'm having trouble sleeping, I will go to the Oxford English Dictionary online and just read through definitions and etymologies and look at where all these amazing words came from. But hospitality really interests me. And this is the definition in the Oxford English Dictionary. The act and practice of being hospitable. An act, so again, within an art and a practice. It's very practical. This isn't about a theoretical construct. Um, and the entertainment and the reception and entertainment um, of guests, of visitors and strangers, of liberality and goodwill. Some wonderful words in there for us to work with as we think about the arts of hospitality and the arts of integration. Anne Carson, um, a classic scholar and great poet, um, has looked in depth at the Greek classical tradition of Xenia. Um, and she develops the idea of Xenia not being about a guest and a host, but actually within that word, having embodied in it both of those understandings of guest friendship, Xenia, from which our word xenophobia comes, as you'll know. Um, and in looking at the, the, the time when those separations of host and guest occurred, she looks at what's happening within wider Greek society and in the reflections um, that there are in literature and particularly in poetry. And she sees those separations occurring at the time when money started becoming currency and changing hand. When we moved from gift exchange into more mercantile habits of human behaviour. And she says that Xenia, it, in spirit, is emphatically non-mercantile. Profit is not the point. The point is to put yourself in debt, perhaps for the moment, 
perhaps for the medium term, perhaps for the long term. It's not being lacking in self-interest, but it is fundamentally about a different non-mercantile understanding, which is not bound into myths of gain and scarcity. In fact, he says, the point is to put yourself in debt. The point is to put ourselves in debt with hospitality. It's not about what they can contribute when they come here, those migrants, those refugees, those asylum seekers. It's not under this reading about what they might take from us. It's about reciprocity, about gift exchange over the long term, individually, in the neighbourhood, in institutions, culturally, linguistically, on every level we can think of. So a gift economy of reciprocity was where this was practised collectively and indi individually. And to do that well, to learn to do that well, and we're really going to have to learn a lot about how to do that well, given how mercantile we have become um, over the last two or three hundred years at least, um, is an art we will need to practise. Perhaps a little like getting good at playing a fiddle. So integration for me is an art that we need to practice. Um, and it's an aesthetic and it manifests itself aesthetically. We know it's happening well when we see the aesthetics of integration occurring. Um, integration is the art of making culture as reciprocity. Um, the theologian and preacher Nadia Boltz um, Weber has spoken rather beautifully and as a contrasting image to that one of the garden fork through the ball about the creative act, but also the act of hospitality, being about being, being like that kind-faced woman, as she says, on the underground or on the bus, who moves her bag so you can sit down. She doesn't have to do that, but she makes room. And that hospitality as an art is about living in such a way that that ethic of making room becomes something that you do when you sit on a bus and you move your bag so someone can sit down. Or, so as a nation, you adjust your position, perhaps a few things about your life, so that someone else can also benefit from the security and the safety that you have enjoyed, the freedoms that you enjoy. It's about making room. You might notice... Um, that the cover of this book is also the image in the picture. It's about making room. That was the gift-giving moment when the cloth, the kente cloth, the hand-woven cloth, was handed over to me um, by a woman who is a friend and a colleague. Um, she handed it over and then she immediately took it back and she said, I'm going to do anthropology to you in the way that for many, many years, many anthropologists from the West have done anthropology to and at and represented others from the global south and she said I'm going to make you a suit and you're going to wear it and I'm going to wander around and see what people say about my tailoring and how they interpret what you're wearing um, so she did this with a number of different cloths and I wandered around the streets of Accra and of northern Ghana and she listened to what people said about me and I couldn't understand because they were all commenting on what I was wearing in a accent or a tone or a dialect or a language that I didn't understand. Um, but what I did know, what I did know was that act of generosity, that act of making something together integrated me very differently than had I just been wearing classic NGO wear as I walked along the street in Accra. And that my skin changed because the cloth changed. And so something very interesting was being performed around those often very binary divides of what is black and what is white. And something new was able to happen within that context of gift exchange and creative playfulness. It turns out later, and I only found this after we'd suggested the cloth went on the front cover of the book, that actually that cloth, these geometric designs, um, are referring to a design which is about um, the sword which is drawn or the sword which comes in peace. And depending on which way up it is, and this way up it's coming in peace, it will tell you whether or not the person is someone you need to fear or someone who's coming in peace. 
So that's all well and good. You've got a bit of a deconstruction of integration. You've got some necropolitics and necroethics, and then some ideas around hospitality as an ethic to practice um, and uh, as part of our work of integration. Um, and maybe that's OK at the level of community, and maybe that's OK at the level of um, institution. And certainly, we push it up to government on a regular basis and ask others to do this work for us. Um, and I watch politicians laboring under that burden of, of how to do this in this present time. But the, the feminist scholar Lucy Rigore has, has said this about <coughs> the limiting or the making room in our own world. She says that meeting a stranger outside of our own boundaries is rather easy and even satisfies our aspirations as long as we can return home and appropriate between ourselves what we have in this way discovered. But to be forced to limit and change our home, and there you can hear the echoes of Derrida, um, or our way of being at home is much more difficult, especially with, um, without being unfaithful to ourselves. So there's a really deep question there about what does change mean and what does it mean to embrace change and what does it mean to embrace hospitality and a real honest naming of the fear that is at the heart of xenophobia and which I believe that she, particularly as a, a psychoanalyst, has accurately understood to be a legitimate human response to things human beings don't understand and points to me to the important work of, int of integration as education um, and as practice and as familiarity. Um, so what does this mean? Well, the more I've worked on questions of integration and the more I've worked in refugee communities, the more I've realised that this is, yes, an academic question for me as an academic, but it's also a personal question to myself as a human being. And so long, long before it became trendy, my husband, the accountant, and I um, started to take in destitute asylum seekers under the scheme which is now nationwide and, and known as Room for Refugees, but then was maybe five or six families in Glasgow who had become aware of the destitution in the city and the difficult situation that many people found themselves in when they'd been released from Dungaval Removal Centre or when they had been refused status and were awaiting appeal as asylum seekers. And so for many years we had a whole range of wonderful different people living with us. The first few days, but particularly the first 24 hours, were awkward. A bit like fumbling to get inside Blackfriars in the dark with my hat on, trying to find my way in and work out who do I ask and I don't really know anyone and what am I doing? And I'm a bit scared and uncomfortable and my flight was late and my train was late and, and then I'm talking to all these strangers. A bit like that. Nerves are natural, normal. You may be refused. You may be in the wrong place. There may be panic down the road as you leap into another taxi and try and find the right place for the lecture. Um, but after a tiny bit of time, a cup of tea, thank you, um, and a couple of friendly faces, you start to settle. And so it was for us. All we had to do was work out where people wanted to put their toothbrushes and maybe find out where the kettle was and the tea bags and know that they could sit with us for a meal, but they could also cook their own food if that was more comfortable. And 24 hours later, we were already functioning. One revolution of the sun is all we need for a drama, says Aristotle. And I believe that's as true for hospitality as it is for what's represented in um, the aesthetics and the poetics. So um, 10 years ago, almost to the day, um, we had a knock on the door and a young woman walked across our threshold as we made room in a small way. She'd been sent to us from the charity. She was an unaccompanied minor. They said, we'll sort this out really quickly. We can't put her in a hostel. Honestly, children, it's really, really unusual. Ten years later, she's just produced my grandchild. Ten years later, she's just produced my grandchild. And so what we've lived in terms of what I'm presenting here, has been around those arts of hospitality. What does it mean to take someone in who doesn't speak, to have a daughter who doesn't speak your mother tongue? What does it mean to learn a daughter tongue? What does it mean to do that for somebody going through puberty, 
going through various stages of trauma, going through various issues of se separation. What does it mean when they come to your house and take her away and accuse your husband of sex trafficking? What does it mean when they do that and take her into Dungaval and then down to Yarlswood, that wonderful hotel that we read about in certain sections of the press? What does it mean? So those questions are questions I live on a daily basis and they change all the time and I now know that they will change all my life as I hold a six week old baby in my arms and she is presented to me by my daughter at the moment of birth as I sit with her as she gives birth. The first words she says to her are, Siuch, this is your grandmother. Say hello to grandma. What does that mean? Those moments of creation, those moments of incarnating the great story, the epic story of hospitality. And I don't say this in any way to say that this is a normal thing, but nor to in any way put it on a pedestal because it's such a normal thing. So many people have been through this experience. It defines us as human beings and it particularly defines us as women and it is women who usually do the dirty work of hospitality. Let's see if I can do this by heart. Um, my name is Alison, and I am a recovering racist. I was born with this addiction because my ancestors were white, and the country I am from grew fat in every imperial fight. Money, privilege, and power come down the barrel of a gun, that wasn't just in history, it's still how this is done. The work which calls me loudly towards your skins and eyes and tears is the work which is intention to assuage those birthright fears. So do not idolise my actions. Do not praise my words as bold. Do not look at my intentions or the papers that I hold. The thoughts I have of charity are just part of this addiction, inherited from a line that is a long and bleached out fiction. I do not have to worry when my skin is in a room or on a train or in a car or in the immigration tomb. I will be given space and money and more time because I'm white, because my ancestors were slave owners or slave drivers and white. But you, my friends, my kindred, will be skinned another way, Blade into diminishments through ever greater punishments and all those cruel admonishments. The only proper meaning of a white man's burden is that for all my days commitment will be to a healing labour. On my deathbed, in my dying, I will be a racist too, but it's shouldering the burden that can lead to something new. Not denial of what sticks to every tone or shade or pore, but the making of relationships that brim with something more. So at times our conversations will make our skins dissolve and around us through the laughter a new world will evolve. So the tears are all that bind us and the skin gives way to bone. And through this work we'll love again and call this earth our home. Thank you. <laughs>